Now, case uh, three. This is a 75-year-old female with a slow-growing, firm white plaque on the cheek. And we've actually got a few pieces here. And from low power, you can already see that there, here's a big lesion here that is basically replacing the dermis and extending down and invading into the subcutis. And you can tell we're on the face because the large, uh, large hyperplastic sebaceous glands. And as are so many of my uh, elderly uh, patients with light skin, a lot of background solar elastosis from chronic sun damage here. So really important to always recognize that looking like I just, that's like a regular thing when I'm looking at skin, how much solar elastosis is there. It doesn't always prove the diagnosis, but there are some diagnoses that I'm not going to make in the absence of solar elastosis. And there are other diagnoses that when there's a bunch of solar elastosis, I'm going to be very, very careful about certain things. So, um, so it's important to know um, how much you know, sun damage there is. It can kind of help alter your pretest probability for different lesions you might consider. And obviously, we have a huge excision here, and this has been taken out way down to, you know, almost to the fascia level. So clearly, this was called something malignant, right? So we can kind of cheat a little bit, because why else would they do this massive excision? And you can see right here is a shave biopsy scar. See the scar there? So that's scar with some giant cell reaction. But down here, we have something that at low power looks quite a lot like scar, right? There's a lot of collagen, some spindle cells. It's not very cellular. It looks like a scar, but there's a couple clues that we're not dealing with scar. Number one, look at these. These are lymphocyte aggregates. Very, very useful clue for this diagnosis. They are present in the majority of cases. Uh, the problem is on a small shave biopsy, it can be very difficult because you may not see these. On a larger sample, you'll usually find the lymphoid aggregates. And also, even though this lesion is sparsely cellular, it has pleomorphic, hyperchromatic, atypical spindle cells. They're just very scattered. They're not nearly as cellular as what I showed you in that atypical fibrosanthoma or in the undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. This is a very hypocellular lesion, but very atypical. This case is actually a, a lot easier than some cases of this entity because the atypia is very obvious and dramatic here. I have seen cases of this though that are only slight hyperchromasia and random occasional pleomorphism and very, very subtle and difficult. And it's those cases where the lymphocyte aggregates really can save you. So does anyone know what this is? You want to type into the chat box any ideas you have here or any stain that you would like to do. There's only one stain actually that's needed here. I mean, you could, you can give me two different answers that I'll accept, but you really only need one thing to prove this diagnosis. And once you've seen these, this is a very classic example. Most of them look like this, although again, sometimes they can be not as, they can be more bland and more deceptively benign appearing and they can mimic scar, they can mimic neurofibroma. Sometimes they look neurofibroma, and yes, the answer is um, desmoplastic melanoma. So the stain you do here is an S100 or a SOX10, which will be diffusely positive in these spindle cells. Don't bother with MART1 or HMV45. It's essentially always going to be negative. These are um, a an unusual type of melanoma. They don't look like other types of melanomas. They don't stain like other types of melanomas. They've like lost all the stuff that makes them melanocyte-like. They've lost it. They're kind of reverting back towards their neural crest origin. They often look like a neural tumor. If you think that you see a neurofibroma, a big neurofibroma on the scalp of an old person, but you see some scattered pleomorphism and some lymphocyte aggregates, oh, be very, very careful. Um, so uh, now I do see neurofibromas on old sun damaged skin all the time. So that's not that that can't happen, but be very careful if it's big, if it clinically didn't look like usually neurofibroma, dermatologists are very good at recognizing them. They'll say differential diagnosis, neurofibroma, to, neurofibroma versus skin tag or acrocordon versus uh, a pedunculated benign nevus. They're soft, fleshy uh, papules or polyps, right? But this desmoplastic melanoma tends to pre, uh, present as a firm kind of scar-like plaque. They often go um, undiagnosed and unbiopsied for years probably because they don't look like regular melanoma clinically. They usually are not pigmented. Um, they can be because sometimes they'll have a melanoma in situ component or they'll coexist with other forms of more conventional invasive melanoma. But when you have a purely desmoplastic lesion like this one, um, they can be very deceptive both clinically and pathologically, okay? So the, um, the key to recognizing desmoplastic melanoma is that it's composed of spindle cells, 
but the spindle cells are separated from one another by dense background collagen, often intermingled with a little bit of that blue mixoid or mucin type of uh, glycosaminoglycans, um, you know, hyaluronic acid ground substance, whatever name you like for that. Pink collagen with a little blue mixoid separating out so that the spindle cells are spaced out from each other. They're not cellular sheets. They're hypocellular. That's the key. And if 90% or more of the lesion looks like this, then we call that a pure desmoplastic melanoma. The reason that's important is there is a different prognostic implication here. Even though these tumors, I would say this is the general rule, not the exception. When these are diagnosed, they often are all the way down in the subcutis. When I, I think I see them most on the scalp, and they often go all the way down to the galea aponeurotica or the periosteum, basically, of the skull at the time of diagnosis, 15 millimeters deep or deeper, you know, which is a very, very deep melanoma. Um, but they have a better overall prognosis on a depth per depth basis compared to uh, more conventional forms of melanoma, okay? That's when they're a pure desmo, 90% or more looks like this, okay? Now, when you have this intermingled with other components, like a more cellular spindled component or an epithelioid kind of regular conventional melanoma, and, it, and that component represents more than 10% of the tumor, then they tend to behave just like the regular melanoma would. So these tend to be have the potential for locally aggressive behavior, but they don't seem to metastasize distantly as often. They also rarely go to lymph nodes. Unlike other melanomas, which tend to metastasize the lymph nodes, Pure desmoplastic melanoma does not usually metastasize to lymph nodes. Um, I've seen one of these grow all the way through the skull and into the dura, and the patient still did not have metastases. So these are something about these, a very, very different sort of tumor. I have several videos about this, so if you want to see other examples, again, if you go to that page here on Kiko and just look for, search the page for desmoplastic melanoma, it's got all of the videos and other whole slide images uh, there, so you can go check out some more examples. This is such an important tumor. If you think you see a scar in old sun damaged skin, but there's not a good reason for a scar to be there, and you see any atypia at all or lymphocyte aggregates, do an S100 or SOX10, please. Okay. The, the other thing I'm going to point out is this. Desmoplastic melanomas love to invade nerves. So perineural invasion is a very common finding. I would say the majority of desmoplastic melanomas that I've seen have perineural. So if you don't find it, go look again. I, it makes me nervous, honestly, to sign them out without uh, finding any perineural because I know that perineural is usually there. Um, and sometimes it can be extensive, so much so that the nerves get filled up by the desmoplastic melanoma and expanded in what we call a neurotropic melanoma, kind of it's a, a form of usually desmoplastic melanoma that is so extensively nerve involved that the nerves themselves become like kind of zombie nerves. They're overtaken by the melanoma cells. And then the last thing is that if you're lucky, you'll get melanoma in situ component over top of the lesion. But about, depending on which study you read, about half of cases do not have any in situ melanoma component. Now, why exactly that is, there's very different thoughts. But uh, in any case, though, if you find a spindle cell thing with atypia and then find melanoma in situ, well, that's great. That really helped you out a lot and helps support your diagnosis. But don't expect that you have to have um, in situ uh, component. So um, I've seen many, many cases that had no melanoma in situ at all. They were purely spindled and intradermal. And also uh, do use a lot of caution before making this diagnosis um, in a non-head and neck site. These, the, these, the vast majority of these that I've seen have been in elderly, uh, light-skinned patients with extensive sun damage on the scalp or the face, okay? I have rarely seen them on the trunk or extremities. The one main exception is I do sometimes see them um, underneath acral melanomas. I've seen some desmoplastic um, acral melanomas, but those were like, I think all of the ones I'd seen had mixed. Uh, they had a mix, the desmo, and then more conventional acral melanoma components. Um, so I have seen desmoplastic in that setting, but it's pretty uncommon in non-head and neck sites. So just so you're aware. All right. So that's desmoplastic melanoma and all of the things. And again, I have uh, some sample reports uh, regarding this and I'll add links to those here. So basically you'll have like an online version of the handout that you can come back to and reference um, anytime that you like. All right.